Good day, everyone, and welcome to PEI's first ever free Wednesday webinar, How to Stop Distracted Driving, Strategies to Protect Your Business, Employees, and Family. This free one-hour webinar is brought to you by the PEI Safety Committee. My name is Scott Borse, and I'm the Director of Technical Programs and Industry Affairs at PEI, and I'm happy to be your host today. Before we get started, I'd like to share how you can participate in today's event. You may submit questions to today's presenter by typing your questions in the question pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. You may submit questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Additionally, today's webinar will be recorded and made available to all members on PEI's website. Please allow five to seven days for the webinar to be posted in the safety section of the website under online resources. Now, let's meet our guest speaker. Joel Feldman is a shareholder in the Philadelphia law firm of Annapol Weiss and the founder of NDD.org, which stands for End Distracted Driving. Joel has made it his mission to raise awareness about the dangers of distracted driving. He has developed science-based distracted driving presentations and other resources used by businesses, schools, and community groups. He also coordinates speakers who have presented to more than 425,000 students across the United States and Canada at no cost to the schools. And he's currently developing programs for elementary and middle school students. Joel himself has given more than 700 distracted driving presentations to more than 125,000 teens and adults since 2012, and he's been the keynote speaker at legal, medical, traffic safety, and business conferences throughout the United States. Joel also will be a safety panelist at this year's PEI convention at the NAC show in Atlanta, and he will be available for more intimate conversations during the PEI one-on-one -on -one events. You can find all the convention details at PEI.org. Joel, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Scott, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and have the opportunity to speak with all of your members. Great, thank you. So Joel, the fueling industry preaches safety all the time. How do you think our drivers stack up to the rest of society? I bet we're a bit safer than most of the drivers. What do you think? Well, I guess I don't really know a whole heck of a lot about your drivers right now. I know a little bit from talking with you, um, but I have talked at lots of different companies. I've talked to construction companies, utility companies, um, all, all sorts of companies where there are drivers all around and we're on the job and on the location, the employer's premises, there are rigorous safety rules. Um, what I find though, is that we're all well-intended we pay attention to the safety requirements. We'll wear our glasses. We'll put our hard hat on when work, at work. But oftentimes when we leave work and we get into the familiarity of our personal car, or even when we're on the job mm -hmm. and we get into our van, I think something happens and we're maybe not as safe as we should be. Okay. So I, I think it's probably an issue across virtually all industries. Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, seeing that, I think with our industry and, and the tremendous amount of windshield time that we have in our industry, um, it's a very good idea to understand what distracted driving is and how that affects all of us. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, take it away. Okay, so I, I need to tell everybody right at the beginning that um, I drove distracted all the time. I'd be a hypocrite if I didn't tell you that. I used to email, text, have meals in the car, and in a little while I'll tell you why I stopped doing that. I can also tell you that when I would drive distracted, if I was paying attention to the other drivers and I saw someone else driving distracted, I would get annoyed because it was okay if I did it, I'm a good driver, I'm a safe driver, I've never been in a crash, but I certainly don't want the guy in the car next to me doing it. So I think there is a little bit of a level of, of hypocrisy. So uh, getting that out of the way, uh, basically I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about how we drive, 
Uh, I'm not there with you like I would be a, if I did a company talk, but we can maybe still with the questions have some interaction. Um, and I'm also going to talk about how, if we have time, how we can take a safe driving message and spread that message through our communities, particularly our families and perhaps schools. And probably we all know that teens are very vulnerable to mm -hmm. distracted driving because they really uh, have uh, very, very little driving experience. So I'm going to ask this. The question basically asks, uh, they did a survey and they asked drivers, what are your biggest highway concerns? And the choices were aggressive drivers, drug drivers, distracted drivers, and drunk drivers. So before I give you the answer, just think about what do you think would be the number one and number two of those? Now I'm going to give you the answers and we'll see how that corresponded with what you thought about. 88% distracted drivers, followed by aggressive drivers, then drugged and drunk drivers. Wow. Um, and I, I, if you were here, I could ask you, um, and I have another slide on this, but let me just do it right now. Just think about it. In the last month, how many of you have driven drunk? How many of you have been a passenger in a car where you thought your driver may have had too much to drink? Not many of you would admit to that, and probably not because you're afraid to admit to it, because it just doesn't happen. How many of you have texted, uh, been on Facebook, uh, sent emails while driving, or been a passenger in a car? Uh, virtually, probably all of us, or most of us, would have to admit to that in our personal job, personal parts, but also in employment. So it's different. We look at drunk driving differently than distracted driving. Drunk driving is not socially acceptable, and we need to get there with respect to distracted driving. Mm -hmm. So let's go past that one, Scott. Okay, so this is a picture of my daughter, Casey, and this is the reason why I no longer drive distracted. Casey was 21, as you can see by the dates. Uh, she was walking across the street uh, in a crosswalk and it was controlled by four-way stop signs. It was a beautiful summer day in a resort community in New Jersey, and a 58-year-old man reaching for his GPS took his eyes off the road, ran through a stop sign, hit Casey, ran her over, said that he never saw her. She, she died later that day in the hospital. Last Wednesday, a week ago, was actually the 10th anniversary of Casey's death. So it's been, it's been a a difficult time in some respects. It's also been a reflective time. Um, I can't bring Casey back, but I can talk to all of you, and I can hope that you can talk to the people that you care about, and we could do something about distracted driving. Um, Casey was um, a wonderful young woman, and part of what was really neat about her was she had the goods on her old man. Uh, she would call me on stuff all the time, Daddy, what are you talking about? Daddy this, daddy that. And more often than not, she was right. And she, she had me look at myself and, and to try to become a better person. She was a reporter and she was killed between her senior. And actually, I said the word killed and I, I chose that word deliberately. I used to say my daughter died. Today, I say my daughter was killed because that 58 year old man made a choice, a choice like many of us have made to take his eyes off the road. Now, I had done that often. I had had some close calls where I'd go over off to the side of the road. The rumble strips would remind me to look up. Mm -hmm. um, and I was lucky. I was lucky. I never, never killed anyone. I was never in a crash. But I could have easily done that. I could have very easily done that. Um, so Casey was that reporter. And um, after she died, or after, listen to me, after she died, after she was killed, mm -hmm. um, some of her colleagues reached out to me and they said that Casey taught them that each and every one of us have a unique and beautiful story. And as reporters, we want to tell those stories. So it's not lost on me that I'm telling my daughter's story in the hope that we can all be safer. So I'm going to play this video and then I'm going to, I'm going to want you to just think about your your reactions to it as you're going through the video and watching this. And, and this could have been me. I often drove with my knees. I'd fill out paperwork and things like that. But 
Think about your reactions for this Quebec bus driver. All right, so what are your reactions? Again, if I was there, I'd walk up to you and I'd stick a microphone in your face and I'd get your reactions. And, I, and I'm sorry, I can't do that, but... Um, yeah, a little different on a webinar, Joel, so... <laughs> it, it is a little different, but these are the most common reactions that we get. Um, I'm going to click it again and we're going to see it's really, really different the way our kids look at it versus us. I never would have thought that distracted driving was selfish or disrespectful. I may have thought it was irresponsible, but I never would have thought it was selfish or disrespectful. I would talk about risky and dangerous. And it was after about six months of doing talks, showing the same video to kids, showing it to adults at businesses, that I began to see this trend. And so I looked into it, and here's what I came away with. I know there's folks out there who text when they drive, whether it's in your van for the company, doing your work, or it's home, or you look at emails. I mean, again, that's the way I was. And probably you haven't been in a crash, because if you were in a crash, you'd probably stop doing it. So I don't think it's, it makes much sense to talk to people who are these so-called, like me, successful texters and emailers, uh, success being defined as we haven't yet been in a crash, about the danger of it. it's We don't think it's dangerous for us. Of course, at the same time, we're screaming and yelling and calling the other people on the road idiots and morons because they're doing it. <laughs> so I don't talk about that, but I will talk about respect. If I had you in a room right now, I'd ask everybody to raise their hand if respect was a core value. I bet all of you would say that. I'd ask you what it meant. And this is basically what people tell me is oh, it means valuing others, listening to others, Treating people the way we want to be treated, that's respect. So we kind of know how we want to be treated on the road, don't we? We don't want other people driving distracted, yet we do it. So I then ask each of you, is there anything the least bit respectful about looking at your phone while you're driving down the road, sharing the road with other cars, maybe pedestrians, maybe even have your own family members in the car? Anything respectful about that? And if I was there and I was in your, your, your conference room or wherever you're listening to this, many of you would have a look on your face right now saying, huh, it's really not respectful. So I'm not gonna talk to you about the danger so much about distracted driving, but if we want other people to respect us and we wanna be the people that we say we are, those people who respect others, Maybe, just maybe, we should drive the way we want other people we share the road with to drive. So just to, get to talk about some stats that we know of, and of course there's no blood test for drunk driving, so we're not sure, and people rarely will admit to a police officer. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. There's no blood test for distracted driving. Uh, people don't admit to officers that they're um, driving distracted, but we know of nine people every day uh, who are killed and more than a th thousand injured, causes collectively more crashes than drunk driving, and fatalities for several years attributable to distracted driving are increasing faster than those for drunk driving, speeding, and failing to wear seat belts. So 2009 was the year my daughter Casey was killed. And in the country, we killed about 3,200 people in that year, and we injured close to 400,000. In 2018, we killed about 3,200 and injured about 400,000. So one might look at that and say, hmm, maybe what we're doing isn't working. Now, I'm optimistic because I talk to so many folks around the country and I get really, really great feedback. I'm optimistic that we can change the way we drive, but clearly there is a big problem. 
uh, danger versus respect. I, I talked about that, and I think that's something we may come back to, but I really want you to think about that. How important is it that each and every one of us is the person that we say we are? We are respectful people. We would probably open the door for someone. We'd help them if they had a heavy package. We'd give them just directions on the road. But when we get behind the wheel of a car, somehow that respect for others gets tossed right out the window. And this is a way that we can think about distracted driving and hopefully get us to reflect and change our behaviors if necessary. So I like to look at the excuses. Why do we do this? Well, it could be it's an important phone call, could be it's just a few seconds, could be the boss is bugging me, um, could be, and this is the one that, that I would always have said, I've never been in a crash, I'm a safe driver. So, so these are the ones we have. I can tell you that I was told that the man who killed my daughter said he only looked away for a few seconds. These reasons were given to me by family members who lost loved ones to distracted driving, I would ask them, what did the person who killed your family member say in the courtroom uh, before they were sentenced? And this is the list of those. And I can tell you, it's not very comforting to hear that my daughter was killed because someone thought they could do something for only a few seconds. As a matter of fact, when I heard that and I thought about that, I was, of course, grief-stricken, but angry, too. I said, well, why couldn't it have been that someone was rushing to the hospital because their dad right. had had a stroke, or their, their daughter was having their first grandchild or something, because it was so meaningless and so insignificant? So we'll talk about some of these. So one of the things, Joel, that uh, I think looking through your presentation and some of the safety facts that we've identified at PEI is, and it really is predicated on it only takes a few seconds. But when you're in a vehicle, even traveling at 25 miles per hour, if you look away for, I think it's less than four seconds, you can drive the half the distance of a football field. Is that, does that make sense? Or is there some other statistics that say, hey, even if I just look out the window for a minute, you know, the distance that I travel is tremendous. And I think we don't really take that into account sometimes. So anything you can speak to that around how far or how fast you go or how far you go if you're driving at a certain speed? Uh, sure, that's a really good point. So the conversion is for every 10 miles per hour we're traveling, we go 15 feet per second. So at 30 miles an hour, it's 45 feet per second. 60 miles an hour, it's 90 feet per second. Wow. And the, the timing is, um, I can't do this with folks here, but I sometimes do it in an auditorium. I'll say, put your phone in your lap. And when I say go, I want you to reach down pick up your phone and look at your last uh, text mm -hmm. and then raise your hand. Generally, it's four to six seconds, four okay. to six seconds. So if I asked the folks who are listening now, hey, the next time you go out on the local interstate, well, I want you to do me a favor. Go about 60 miles an hour and close your eyes for me and count to <laughs> four. I don't think too many of them are going to do it. Right. But we are kind of doing the same thing anyway. Now, there's a recent study that came out. It's not in the presentation, but it's really interesting. It looked at the glances away from the road and the time of those glances. And what it came up with is glances at two seconds or less are reasonably safe. Once you get over two seconds, it's dangerous. So the authors actually are trying to work on a program where they can have people driving their cars. And let's say you want to change the radio. You say, OK, I'm going to change the radio. I'm going to have to look away from the road. You start counting 1,001, 1,002, and when you get to two, if you haven't changed the radio, look back at the road and mm -hmm. take another glance to keep our glances under two seconds. But it's a really good point about the distance we travel when we look away from the road. Good. Thank you. If you'd asked me before Casey was killed, was I a safe driver, I would have told you yes. No crashes, no tickets. Looking back, I was a lucky driver. Today, I'm a safe driver. Today, I'm a respectful driver. Today, I'm the kind of driver you want to be in the car next to you when you're driving down the road or if you're, one of your family members is driving down the road. I'm doing my best to keep me safe. If I have passengers, keep my passengers safe, but also to keep you safe. Uh, I was never that kind of driver before. I took it very cavalierly. Today, I'm that respectful driver. And when I get in the car, I say to myself, OK, You've got an awesome responsibility. Keep yourself safe. Keep everybody else safe. 
And when I get someplace safely, I pat myself on the back, uh, not literally, but figuratively, and I say, good job, you did that. And that's, I think, the kind of drivers we want to share the roads with. We don't want to share the, the road with drivers who, when they're not in the car, are respectful people, but when they get behind the wheel of the car, something happens to them. So um, I know a little bit, because Scott, you've told me that, that many of the folks who are listening will be in company vehicles and they'll have many stops during the day going out to service stations. So um, I know that from what you've told me that sometimes they'll be driving someplace, they may have a schedule and they'll get a call from dispatch and dispatch says, no, don't go to the next location, turn around. Right. That could be an issue. That could be an issue. And if you're not looking at your phone and you're not looking at text, you may be sitting there saying, well, how can I handle that? How can I work on this? Well, I've, I've done numbers of talks with folks, most recently Comcast. And what, what they do is they say, if dispatch has someone and it's an emergency, they're going to call. They're going to call so you can answer Bluetooth. They're not going to text. There are some risks to talking on the phone, even hands-free because we know that your mind is not 100% devoted to the call, but uh, you need to work within the confines of your job. You need to do your job right, and you don't wanna be wasting a lot of time. So maybe you can work on it, that you can have dispatch contact you with a call that you can answer hands-free Bluetooth, and then if you need to t write down anything, just pull over to the side of the road and make it short. You know, we don't want you looking away from the road um, Hands-free is not entirely risk-free, but hands-free is a lot safer than looking away from the road at your phone for six seconds. Now, so, so would it be a good suggestion then that, that any communication, if you're behind the wheel, it should be behind a vehicle that's not moving or on the side of the road? Is that a, is that a good process or is that, uh, let me explain it better. So let's say I'm driving down the road and I get a text or I get a phone call. Um, would a suggestion be or a, a best practice be to pull over and take care of that rather than continue the drive or whatever that 30 seconds or a minute and a half or whatever it's going to take to respond to a text or respond to a phone call. The best way to do that is to basically make sure the vehicle's not moving at that point and particularly on the side of the road. Absolutely. But you want to think about it because there's a lot of crazies out there. <laughs> And there are a lot of people looking at their phones. So right. just pulling over into the shoulder may not be safe. If you can, get off, get into a parking lot. Okay. Don't trust the people behind you. Okay. And I, I know, and you know, and what I'm saying is hands-free is a little safer, but I know a number of families whose loved ones were killed by distracted drivers who were hands-free Bluetooth. And we don't, we don't really have a lot of time for it, but I'll just finish the thought. When we're, the studies show if we're holding the, the wheel and we're talking hands-free, something happens to our brains so that we don't actively scan the road. We exhibit what's called tunnel vision and we don't look off to the sides. Tunnel vision is not the best way to be out there and being a defensive driver. So uh, this just uh, this multiple choice uh, asks what percentage of employees drive, answer, make work-related communications while driving. and the answer is 43%. The numbers over towards the middle just show the breakdown, how we got to the 43% by age group. And you can see from the 18 to the 44-year-olds, it was 54% of them. Now, I'm not here telling people, I'm not, I don't tell anyone what to do. We, we talk about stuff. People can make their own decisions. And if I, hopefully, if I give you some good reasons to make some different decisions, but you have to do your job. I want you to do your job safely, but you have to figure out within the confines of your job, talking to coworkers, supervisors, what works best, including that suggestion that you right. get hands-free calls and pull over to the side of the road and better than that, off very safely so you're not even near the road. Mm -hmm. So why do we make these communications? This was an interesting survey that the travelers did. 38% felt the need always to be available. Now, if you think about that, that is the employee's belief, the need to always be available. 37%, okay. uh, for those who don't know what that was, don't feel badly. I didn't know what that <laughs> meant either. FOMO is fear of missing out. We are in a society today where lots of us, and that explains the compulsion with our phones, fear of missing out. 
17% don't want to upset the boss and 15% just can't shut off from work. So some parts of this is the boss says you have to be accept, accessible, mm -hmm. but most of it really is our wanting to be accessible, our fear that we won't be connected, our fear that we will miss out. So to me, that's positive because it suggests that it's not necessarily employment driven. If your boss tells you you have to answer his or her text all the time and you have no choice, I feel badly for you. But that is your job and you're going to have to work that out. But most companies are, don't want that. They want you to be safe. And that's one of the amazing things about talking with companies all across the country. I'm so impressed about how they want their, their employees to be safe. Talking with associations like this, they want their members to be safe. Mm -hmm. And that's paramount. Good. So I'm a lawyer. I'm a personal injury lawyer. I don't practice law a lot anymore, but I, I do still handle distracted driving cases and I work with lawyers across the country. But at a law firm, we would tell our employees, be safe when you drive. But I'd be the first one, if I couldn't find something, to be texting or emailing my associate or someone, where is that? Where did I put that? So we're telling them to be safe, yet we're asking them not to be safe by constantly pestering them when they're driving. So, again, this is the same issue. Work this out. This can be worked out in advance. Now, I imagine that a large percentage of, of, of all of you who are listening are moms and dads. I'll go into auditoriums or I'll go into businesses and conference rooms and I'll just say, moms and dads, raise your hands. They raise their hands. I say, keep your hands up if you do anything to keep your children safe. Does hands stay up? Sometimes they're waving both hands in the air. <laughs> and then I say, only keep your hands up if you haven't driven distracted with your kids in the car most of those hands come down and moms and dads feel embarrassed and ashamed. We can get away with it longer, not forever, but we get away with it longer than our kids because we have more experience, but our kids are learning from us. Another good reason to put our phones down is to keep our kids safe. So we have cause to be concerned about our kids Motor vehicle crashes are the leading cause of death for our children to about age 23 or 24, and more than 50%, it's close to 60% of serious teen crashes are caused by distraction. If you go on any of your state DOT sites and look up distraction facts or go on the U.S. Department of Transportation site, you'll see those numbers for distraction, probably some distraction affected crashes, somewhere between 15 and 20%. It's three times as high for our children. Wow. Three times as high. So let's just look at this video. Um, uh, parents had agreed to have their kids be part of a research experiment. And what they did is they had two cameras in the kid's car. One, you'll see the kid's face. The other, you'll see the road in front of them so you can see what's going on at the time. There's four little vignettes. And if you look carefully in one, maybe two, you'll see that the kid is going off the road. And what they do is they look up from their phone for a split second, then look back down at their phone, even though it's clear that they're going off the road. Why do they do that? Well, the experts who study the way our brains work say a quick one or two second quick glance up at the road, taking it away from our phone, is not enough time to orient us. Mm -hmm. Our eyes see it, but our brains don't perceive it. So, yes, the kids overcorrected uh, because they're inexperienced, but uh, our fears about our children are, are well-deserved. Uh, there are some studies that show that it takes our kids 
about two years of driving where their crash risk will come down to about what it is for their parents. Uh, practice is really, really important, really, really important. So I go into schools and I'll ask the kids, once they get comfortable with me, I'll say, raise your hands if your moms or dads drive distracted with you in the car. And what we'll get is we'll get 70 to 80% of the kids raising their hands. So I was one of those parents. Actually today, I wonder whether or not Casey's little brother, my son, Brett, whether or not he might drive distracted, even though his big sister was killed because he saw me drive distracted. I often have kids telling me that moms and dads are hypocrites because they'll say, don't you do this, don't you do this, but what are we showing our children? Yeah, Joel, I guess that's one of the things I've got to jump in there. And, and as I was reviewing the presentation and preparing for this webinar, I got to this slide and it was kind of uh, very compelling to me because I look back on the way that I drive. Um, I've got a heavy foot, I'm distracted, I'm doing other things in the vehicle. And although I think I'm safe because I use Bluetooth and I don't look at my phone while I drive, I am distracted by other things that go on there. So um, I got to say for my three daughters, I, I showed my one daughter the, the videos that we just looked at and she basically came back and said, well, yeah, we watch you do the same things, dad. And even though we say that, so, you know, it was a little uh, compelling for me to actually go through this and say, hey, you know what, I'm at fault here too. And just probably like as many people, we just don't realize it, especially after we've been driving for many years that we don't understand the impact that we have on the younger people in our, I guess our, well, it's like I said, the impact that we have when other people see us drive, so. Yeah, I think probably a lot of us would have to admit to that. Um, and it's it's probably not a comfortable feeling for those of you who are sitting in the audience who are moms and dads and know that you drive distracted with your kids. Maybe some of your kids have even called you out on it. So um, I'm going to play this next video, and in it you'll hear a statistic that talks about, you know, just um, how influential we are, in this case in a negative sense, uh, with our children when they watch our behaviors. Teens whose parents drive distracted are twice as likely to also drive distracted. Our children look up to us. They pick up our habits, good and bad. What behaviors are you teaching your children? What distractions would you give up if it meant saving your child's life? So sometimes the schools will want me to come in and, and, and talk with the kids, whether it's ninth grade or 10th grade or the whole school, and they'll say, would you come in and talk to the moms and dads? And I'll say yes, but only on one condition, that we don't advertise it as a general program to learn about distracted driving. We advertise it as come to this program and learn how to keep your children safe from distracted driving. Why do I do that? Two reasons. One we get a lot more people to show up because that appeals to moms and dads and our, you know, this gut level fear that something is going to happen to our children. And we all have that as moms and dads. Uh, the other is I don't want them to think that I'm going to turn the program on them <laughs> and I'm going to call them out on their driving. But moms and dads will come up to me. What's the most important thing I can do to keep my kids safe? And they set it in here be the driver you want your kid to be. Right. Let's say you have kids at home, like Scott, you do. You have mm -hmm. teenagers at home. You have driven distracted with your kids in the car. Yep. Maybe you go home and you say, you know, I was wrong to do that. I want you guys to keep an eye on me. It's become a habit. I want you to say, dad, put the phone down. Right. Dad, put the phone down. And if you do that, but don't then tell them, and I don't want you to drive distracted. Make this conversation about you and your behavior, and it, stick, it sticks with them, and they'll be less likely to drive distracted. That's what we need to do for our kids. Good, good advice. This is encouraging when I hear this, but it's also a little sad because they're saying, you know, my mom and dad are not good role models for my little brother and sister. I have to be that role model. Well, we can change that. Everybody who's listening today can change that. I want you to drive safely even when you're alone, but gosh, 
we need to drive safely when we're with our kids. And maybe the, the word is, I shouldn't say safely because some of you will say, well, I haven't been in a crash. So let's just say we need to drive in a manner that teaches our children to drive safely. We need to be that respectful person. So we have an annual, our organization is NDD.org, and SAD is Students Against Destructive Decisions, a national organization. It's a wonderful organization. They have chapters in every state. So we have a video contest uh, with them, and this was the first place winner um, that we announced a month or two ago. And it was remarkable to me because for the three years we've had the video contest, I hadn't had many, if any, videos from teens where they didn't give the teen perspective, but they gave the parent perspective. Have a day. Nice going, kid. One more. One more. And right, listen, I'm sorry. We got to rock and roll. I got to pick up your sister. Pick up my glove while you're at it. We'll, we'll come back next week. Okay. Hey, mother's calling. Hold on a second. Yeah. No, I know. No, we're heading there now. Listen, somebody else is calling in. Let me just see who this is. Dad! Dad! You ready, Dad? Yeah. Yeah, I'm ready. I sure am. All right, let's do this. I have done talks with dads who killed their children while driving distracted. I have done talks with dads who paralyzed their children while driving distracted. When your child is killed, you question everything. I know I questioned that maybe I hadn't taught my daughter how to cross the street properly. You know, you, you, you think of things and you wonder, you feel guilt about it. It's hard enough living without Casey and seeing all her friends and everyone going on with their lives and seeing all that she's missing and all we're missing with her. But I didn't have anything to do with her crash. I can't imagine what it would be like to know that I was responsible for my child's death or in this video paralysis. So um, let's be those drivers that, that we want to be, um, that we need to be for our children. So after Casey was killed, her friends wanted to do a video. They wanted to talk about how they drove distracted and they all drove distracted. And uh, we came up with this idea. We did this video for the US Department of Transportation and it shows Casey's friends, but also shows my wife. And my wife will tell you what Casey's last words were. We heard that from the rescue folks what Casey's last words were before she lapsed into unconsciousness. I can also tell you that I remember my last conversation with Casey the night before she was killed. Uh, we were together, the whole family, and I asked her, because she seemed so happy. I said, Casey, are you happy? And she said, Daddy, what do you mean? Do you mean now in the moment? Or do you mean like for my entire life? And I said, both. A and she said, uh, yes and yes. And that's helpful. It's helpful. This is a face of distracted driving. This is Casey Feldman. Casey was a daughter, granddaughter, sister, niece, cousin, and friend. She was kind, caring, had a great sense of humor, lived life to its fullest, and was loved by many. She was so funny and so vibrant and so beautiful in every way. She was smart, she was intelligent, she had goals for herself, she was really grounded, and she was someone that you knew would grow up to be somebody special, somebody important to other people. Casey's life ended on July 17, 2009. She was struck and killed by a distracted driver while she was crossing the street in a crosswalk. He had taken his eyes off the road for just a few seconds. 
it was the first time that I ever lost somebody, a friend, and someone my age. And sorry. And it just it made me realize that that could have easily have been me. That could have been my sister. It could have been anybody. Before Casey's accident, I would I drove distracted and like I would let people who were driving me be distracted. I know in high school, rushing around to activities, I'd be eating in the car and doing makeup in the car. I actually wrote a speech in the car once. I was changing the radio station um, while backing out of a parking spot and I hit a utility pole. I would take my eyes off the road to do makeup, to text message, to use my phone. I think definitely as a teenager, when you're first driving, you do feel invincible and driving can become a secondary task to whatever you're doing. You're basically operating a weapon. I think that people need to realize that they're operating something that has the power to change like thousand lives. No matter what it is you're trying to do in the car, it's not worth it. When you're driving, you are not, it's not a secondary task. It is the only task you should be doing. We must learn from Casey's death that as young people, we are not invincible. And we learn that it just doesn't happen to other people. It happened to Casey, someone that we love and miss very much. I think of Casey lying on the roadway after her accident and when the police officer asked her how it occurred, she said, I want my mom. And I wasn't there to comfort her in those last moments. What will it take for us to change the way we drive? I've stopped having meals in the car. I put one CD in and I just don't change it. I make sure my purse is in the back seat now. My phone is in the back seat. If I'm driving, that's the only thing I'm doing. This is the picture I have in my car of Casey to remind me to keep my eyes and mind on the road. You could do the same with a picture of somebody that you love and care about. So your audience can't see this, but our audience can't see it, but I've rolled back my sleeves and on my right wrist, I have about seven or eight wristbands and my left wrist, I have about the same. Uh, pink was Casey's favorite color, so I wear a pink wristband to remember Casey. Um, all of these wristbands were given to me by parents whose kids were killed by distracted drivers. Some of these, some of these were given to me by, by children whose grown adult parents were killed. Uh, but what they say to me is they say, do something so this doesn't happen to other families. And after doing this, marking the 10th anniversary of Casey's death and, and being so fortunate to talk to kids and grown-ups and at businesses and associations across the country, I firmly believe that good come, can come out of tragedy. And I, I mean, I have to feel that way, mm -hmm. but I really think it's true. We need each and everybody, we need all of your help to keep us safe, whether it's respect, whether it's being good role models. A lot of us also were worried about other people on the road. Many of us learned to be defensive drivers. How can we be a defensive driver if we're looking at our phone? And today we need to be defensive drivers more than ever before. So let's just talk about some of the practical things that we can do. Um, first off, I think we have to recognize that we have a habit. How do you break habits? Well, you have a plan, you have a plan. So why should we do this? to be the respectful person, uh, to be defensive drivers and protect ourselves and to be the drivers we want our children to be. So we are going to have to create safe driving habits and that means really avoid temptation. I have an iPhone. Scott, if you call me when I drive back home from here um, or text me or do anything, uh, I won't get the notification. It's blocked. Uh, my phone, once it pairs with the Bluetooth in the car, blocks the notification, you'll get a customized text message saying, hi, it's Joel, I'm driving, it's not safe to respond. With respect to um, the, that's the iPhone, if you're on the uh, Galaxy on the Android system, there's something very similar. Now, if you need to have your dispatch or someone call you, you can go in there. I mean, I don't advise it unless you have to, but you can set up a couple of phone calls and a couple of contacts that will bypass that. Okay. Again, we don't want to really bypass it, but if you need to for work, I get it, I understand, I want you to be safer. You have to make the, the, the choices that you need for yourself. Yeah, I gotta say, as I was preparing for this, this presentation today and I came to this slide, um, I actually looked through this to figure out how can I get this do not disturb on my phone? You know, and it's funny, I'm gonna back to the hypocritical moment for a minute because I didn't think for me to use it, I'm gonna get that for my kids. 
and in reality, as we're talking about this today, it's really, it's not just for my kids, my three daughters. We need to get this for everyone. I mean, if there was an automatic way that, you know, the, the iPhone or your cell phone could sense that you're driving and it automatically says, hey, I'm not going to answer this. But there are apps for that. Um, and I'm going to tell you that right after this, it's going on my phone today. Okay. So with the iPhone, it's a setting. You go to your okay. settings. It's about the seventh or eighth one down. Do not disturb. Right. You'll see it. Um, and then every time you get in your car, uh, once you turn the car on, there'll be a message that comes up and you have the option to, I mean, I'm not, I hate to tell people how to bypass stuff, but you have the option. You could say, I'm not driving if you're a passenger. Okay. That sort of thing. Right. But you can set it up so you have just some, a few of your favorites. And what they can do is you can have a special ringtone or they can call in and you can answer it hands free. Okay. I will just say this real quickly. I know we're, we can still have some time. I, 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 didn't, I don't have the slide here, but let's talk about defensive driving. Defensive driving, and maybe many of you were trained on the Smith rules of safe driving, defensive driving, uh, but it basically says aim high, get the big picture, uh, look out for the other guy, and, and leave an out for yourself. A better way, I think, or maybe not better, but another way to think about it is with, with the acronym SPIDER. Okay. SPIDER. What's involved in defensive driving? And my point I'm going to make is that you can't be a distracted driver if you're going to be a defensive driver. S, spider, scanning, scan the roadway. As I talked about before, when we're, even when we're talking hands-free, there's something happens to our brain that we don't scan. And clearly, if we're looking down at our phones, we're not scanning the road. P, predict where the danger will come from. I'm, going through a, I'm coming up to a light. It's green. I know the car coming perpendicularly has to have a red light. I'm going to predict that that person may be on their phone. They may be looking at a pretty girl. They may be eating a Big Mac or something, and they're not paying attention. Mm -hmm. I'm going to watch them even though I have the green light. If they start to come through the, the light, I've now identified the eye. I've identified an actual risk. D, I have to make a decision. What am I going to do? Am I going to swerve, slam on the brakes, blow the horn? And then ER is execute that response, E and R together. Now, part of this is to say this is what we need to do to keep ourselves safe. But part of it is to drill home the idea being a defensive driver takes a lot of paying attention. It takes a lot of concentration. And if we're not looking at the road or even if we're in a long hands-free cell phone conversation, those abilities are, are, are compromised. So getting back to this, we can plan the, uh, what I'll do is, I mean, it's not, uh, it's, it was about half an hour for me to come out here to Scott's house where I'm doing this. Uh, I won't stop on that, but if I would drive from Philly to Harrisburg, mm -hmm. it's about an hour and 45 minutes. I will stop twice because my calls are important and I wanna know what's going on. I'll pull into the rest area and I'll look. I don't need to do it when I'm driving. Today, I don't want to do it when I'm driving, and I'm no longer tempted, but it took a while. You have to avoid temptation. Right. Many of you fly on airplanes. <clears throat> I bet some of you, when the flight attendant says, put your phone on airplane mode, some of you actually <laughs> are listening. Some of you are actually listening, and they do it. So we'll do it when we're in a plane. Why shouldn't we do it when we're in our cars? Right. And for most of us, the thing that can take away our personal liberty, meaning jail, more than anything else, is our driving. And people go to jail who kill or seriously injure folks while driving distracted. And then the last point here is reward yourself. I mean, I reward myself. It's important for me to re remind myself, hey, that's a good thing you're doing. We're all human. We want to be appreciated. This is self-appreciation. It works. The psychologists talk about it. It works. So we have these, these, these again, these points. Uh, there are some apps out there. Uh, my son's in Colorado. Um, I have an app that's called Life 360. Okay. You can download it for free. And I could look at my phone right now and see, is my son in Colorado? Is he at his office? Is he at his house? Or is he driving? And even though I hope he wouldn't respond to a call or text while I'm driving because his big sister was killed, I have some... I feel better about it because I won't text him when he's driving. Right. Uh, that's free. If you want to spend, I think it's $7 a month, you can actually get a, a driving report 
and it'll measure uh, the hard braking, the quick acceleration, the hard cornering, and cell phone use. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if you do that with your kids, they can look at you and they can talk to you, but you can look at them. It makes for a good conversation. There are actually some companies that, not with Life360, but other app providers who will actually set up a contest. So you can have a contest maybe within PEI or maybe okay. some of your members at, at their companies to see who the safest driver is and it can monitor it. There are Excellent. things like that, that that are fun th kind of things to do. Here are some other technological things. There's lots of them out there, um, you know, and, and you know, I don't think I have to go through these, but there are lots of them out there. There's so much technology. Planned periodic stops. And now the last bullet is tell friends and families and coworkers about your commitment to drive safer. People will generally say, hey, that's a good idea, because again, remember, no one wants the guy in the car next to us to be driving distracted. If you have an automatic response to, let's say, do not disturb while driving, and someone texts you, it'll come up and say, hey, I'm driving, I don't want to get back to you. You spread the message. I haven't found anybody who, who has been annoyed that someone didn't get back to them if they knew that they were driving safely. Um, I don't know, do we, do we have some questions and things we want to get to? Yeah, let me uh, let me pull that up for a moment, and oh, there we go. All right. So as we approach our end of the time here, I'm going to look to see if we have any questions from our audience. Um, we have several questions that have come in. So Joel, let's look at this one. Um, one of the questions is, what would be two or three things that we should have in our company policy against cell phone use while driving? Okay, great question. So I, I think we can probably all agree that we don't, uh, we don't want anyone texting or emailing while driving. So the policy could be, now, there's different laws. Uh, everyone comes from a different state practically, so there's all sorts of different laws. But I think a basic policy is, um, no looking away from the road, no texting, no emailing, no looking at Facebook, things like that. Um, and then saying, if you need to, uh, hands-free calls, but minimize those. Okay. Uh, make a choice to minimize those calls. I think that would be a great policy. Good. Even pulling over to the side of the road, maybe, pull, as a, as pulling a potential? Over, pulling <laughs> over to the side of the road. And, you know, I think uh, we have a safe driving policy, but I actually, and, and we, people can go on our site, and dd.org and download it or they can okay. email email me um, but it doesn't talk about respect okay and I think that's so vital I mean we're all good people we want to do the right thing and you know it is inconsistent with respecting others to be doing this while we're driving and sharing the road with others so I think policies that talk about respect and you know just quickly I go into high schools it's a rare high school where they don't have on a banner or poster a core value of our school is respect. respect. Right. And moms and dads are teaching their kids about respect. We need to include while we're driving in the car, we need to model that respect. Thank you for that question. Okay. So along that lines, we have another question um, from an attendee. So they say, how often should you reinforce a safe driving policy within the company? There are some studies that show, um, See, I, the way most safe driving policies are enforced is if there's a crash. Okay. Absent a right. crash, right. absent a crash, there are some companies that have driver cams and they actually videotape the drivers. Uh, most of those will only record when there's an event. Otherwise, it just records over. So um, I, can, I tend to like to think that the, the, the stick is the wrong way to go. Mm -hmm. It should be the carrot. Um, you know, we can have lunchbox talks, we can have safety talks, and just reminders. Um, for some of the companies I've spoken at, uh, I'll send them, if a new research article comes out, I'll send okay. it to them, and they'll send it out to folks. I'll do that with you, Scott, too. If stuff comes out, you can send it out to folks. It's a habit. You know, think about it. I checked one day, just because I wanted to see, I looked at my phone 76 times. Hmm. The studies show people my age, I'm 64, we look at our phones maybe somewhere as between 30 and 80 times a day. Younger people, well over 100 times a day. Right. Why should we assume that it's going to be easy not to look at our phones when we get in the car? So we need to have these policies, but we need to have employers and other folks giving us a carrot. Hey, then these contests sponsoring people and reminding them. 
Hey, it's good that you mentioned the carrot because we actually have another question from an attendee that says, should I provide incentives for my employees for safe driving or should I just enforce a no tolerance policy? I think, I think a no tolerance policy makes sense, but I think there's different ways that we can apply it. Um, maybe we talk to folks, um, hopefully the folks that this, this question are sending in on, hopefully his folks are sitting in on this uh, webinar mm -hmm. and they're watching this. But I think having those, um, having those talks um, all the time makes sense. So what's a zero tolerance policy? It could be anything from firing, it could be suspension, it could be anything. So I, I, you know, I leave that to what makes the most sense for their particular uh, job and their company. Okay, good answer. So just checking the time here. I think we have time for one more question before we want to wrap up. So last caller, or not caller, but last attendee submitted this question. I can have a policy for company car use, but how do I reinforce the message that they need to have that same mentality while driving for personal use? It's a really good question. We didn't get into it, but some of the companies that I work with, they say, you know what? We're going to be safe at work, but we want each and every one of our employees to go home to a safe family. So they encourage the employees to talk to kids, to talk to spouses, significant others. Um, some of the uh, companies also will be part of our speaker program. We have speakers that go out into high schools and the communities. And oh, Scott and I would be happy to work with anyone who says, you know, I'd like to take this presentation and I'd like to go into the local high school and talk about it. Um, I think. Oftentimes, when people say, hey, I saw this seminar, I saw this webinar, take a look at this video, and they say that it was given by the dad, and maybe you play them the video that I played you a couple minutes ago of Casey with her mom and her friends. Mm -hmm. Maybe you play the video of the, the dad who paralyzed his kid. I mean, you know, that's right. make-believe, but it's powerful. Right. And a lot of you probably have significant others or spouses who are driving distracted, and and lecturing hasn't worked to get them off the phones, maybe just say, hey, take a look at this video and say, I met the dad, the dad's a friend of mine. I hope all of you with this hour we've spent together would say, hey, I, I know Joel, he's a friend of mine, and I'd love for you to uh, feel that way. All right, great. Well, I appreciate your time today. Um, a couple other questions have come in, basically just asking about, uh, can we get a copy of this presentation? Um, and this has been recorded. Uh, it will be available on PEI's website probably within the next five to seven days. Uh, once we convert it and get it up on the site, it will be available for all PEI members. But So I wanted to answer that one as well. So Let me just interrupt go ahead, a second. Go ahead. Anybody can, can email me at info at ndd.org if you say, hey, we want to bring this presentation to a local our school and our community. Uh, I always tell people if you get two or three schools, I'll come. If right. you only get one school, I'll get another speaker who's local to give it. And we have speakers all across the country. Okay, so there's that community involvement too. So if one of our member companies is looking to promote this and they want to go into their community, they could reach out to you as well. You could provide information, possibly even speak or something like that, or at least put them in touch with a distracted driving speaker that could basically do the similar presentation that we did this afternoon. Absolutely. And I'll tell you, principals, superintendents, teachers, are so incredibly get grateful to the companies for setting up talks. So incredibly grateful. Okay. So I'm going to say thank you very much. Um, this is going to wrap up our uh, first ever PEI free Wednesday webinar. Again, how to stop distracted driving, strategies to protect your business, employees, and family. And I'm going to repeat that uh, email address for you if you want to get in touch with Mr. Feldman. Uh, it is info at ndd.org. Again, info at ndd.org. And as a reminder, Joe also will be a safety panelist at the PEI convention at the NAC show in Atlanta in October this year. And he will be available for more intimate conversations there at PEI 101. You can find all the convention details at PEI.org. And for our attendees today, once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would greatly appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. 
And as I stated previously, today's webinar was recorded and will be made available to all PEI members on PEI's website. The webinar will be posted in the safety section of the website under online resources. So on behalf of PEI, the PEI Safety Committee, and our presenter, Mr. Joel Feldman, thank you for joining us today. I'm Scott Boris, and remember, stay safe. Thank you.